can't a person be a Christian without joining the church? This asked a businessman of his Christian friend. Well, the reason he joins the church is that he is a Christian, was the answer. But why should he belong to the church? The Christian did not give an immediate answer, but a few days later, as the two men walked together, they passed a church. See that dark, dusty window? asked the Christian. Yes, what about it? said the businessman. Nothing very inspiring about it that I can see. Let's see it from the inside, said the friend, as he led his companion through the open door into the church. Gone was the dark dullness of the outside view, for the afternoon sun was streaming through the window and gloriously lighting the stained glass figure of Christ, the Good Shepherd. The men looked in silence at the brilliantly lighted face. Finally, the Christian said, Clearer, isn't it? There you have it. Christians join the church because one can see Jesus better from the inside. Well, it's a nice story. It was used as the introduction to the Voice of Prophecy Bible course. And I suppose that we could think of other alternatives to that story. We could think of night with the light shining out from the church and being on the outside where it looks more glorious from there. <laughs> and of course that would ruin the story. There has to be, of course, something better than a story to show significance to the church. And uh, what is there better than a story? The authority of God's Word. However, I kind of like the story nonetheless and would like to think that Jesus is revealed better from the inside of the church. Has that been your experience? Uh, apparently it has been for some. And apparently for others, it has not been, according to them and the way they sometimes talk. Now, when we think of the church, we think of at least three aspects. We think of brick and mortar, and in this case, huge cement slabs. I asked the builder of this church if there are some parts of this church that uh, would be more dangerous than others during an earthquake. He says, there are some places I wouldn't be during an earthquake. So I decided to follow the builder at the first earthquake in this church. Cement, stone, physical building. Is it significant or not? Sometimes people become uptight because they say uh, too much money lavished on a costly sanctuary, church. And they forget about Solomon's temple and even the sanctuary in the wilderness. A lot of gold there. It's all for what purpose you are expending the money and lavishing the wealth, for the purpose of self-glorification or for the purpose of God's glory. And there can be a fine line, right? Now, at first glance, we tend to dismiss the brick and mortar, and we quote things like the sermon that my brother preached at the dedication of the Mountain View Church several years ago. He and I both had a part in building it. And he came back for the opening Sabbath, and uh, of all things, he preached, God dwelleth not in temples made with hands. What a text for the opening day. <coughs> of a new church building. But he had a point. Something more than brick and mortar. On the other hand, we can turn to John, the second chapter, verse 16, and we can discover that Jesus drove people from 
the temple from the church, if you please, and said, Make not my father's house a house of merchandise and so forth. You're familiar with the story. So Jesus himself had a tender regard for a physical building which had been built for his father's house. And we need not dismiss it lightly, in spite of the fact that the early Christians knew very little of uh, church buildings. They met because of the stress of those days and persecution. They met in quiet, out-of-the-way places. And perhaps when you think of the church, you think of uh, another phase of the church, which would be the organic church. When you think of the organic church, do you think of Adventists and Methodists and Baptists and Presbyterians? Or do you think of a local organized church Is it a denomination or a local church? And what would be the purpose of an organic church? Well, let's make sure that Scripture has to do with organic churches as well. Probably one of the most clear places to study this is through the writings of Paul and the early apostles, the Christian church. Paul speaks again and again of organized churches in particular cities, and he speaks of the groups of churches under one heading called the church, obviously referring to something we might call a denomination today. He speaks of uh, headquarters of the church in Jerusalem, and he refers to uh, certain actions being taken at headquarters by leading brethren, which obviously indicate an organic church, a denomination, if you please, something that had significance and relevance in the days of Paul and the apostles. In Revelation, the first chapter, verse 12, 13, and 20, we are, we are reminded of the seven churches represented by seven golden candlesticks. And, of course, those who have studied them notice that they have to do with seven periods of the Christian church. But when you think of uh, the third aspect of the church, then you find something that seems to ring a bell, particularly today with uh, many young people. The mystical church, the universal church, the church that cannot be seen by its lines and buildings and organization. Uh, faithful followers of God, faithful believers in Christ everywhere. The mystical church. And this is one of the things that many people today, having become disenchanted with the organic religion, uh, are sympathetic. They like the idea of being a Christian at home, of uh, being a believer with fellow believers wherever they might be in the world, the mystical, ethereal, unorganic church. Now, I want to recommend for those of you who have had serious questions about the church, I want to recommend a little booklet. Uh, this is by C.T. Everson, the uh, granddaddy of Adventist evangelists that I quote frequently. You can still get it at the bookstore even though he's been gone a long time. This is one of the most uh, comprehensive, composite, exhaustive studies of the church and the pertinent texts on the church that you can find anywhere. Clear, concise, to the point. And it's called Church Membership, simply by Everson. And this is what he says concerning this person that uh, likes to think in terms of the organic church. You know, the person who speaks of the church universal and belongs to the mystical church Wherever I go, I meet people who tell me that they believe in the church, but they say the church they believe in is the church universal. They tell me that Christ's church is composed of all the various denominations. They claim that the record of membership is kept in heaven and that no one really knows who are members of Christ's church except Christ himself. 
When you ask them if they are members of a church, they tell you, no, not any particular church, but I am a member of the Church Universal, the records of which are kept only in heaven. And he immediately refers you to a scripture found John the 10th chapter, verse 16. Perhaps it would be well to read this one. John 10, verse 16. Jesus is speaking. He's talking about himself as the good shepherd. And he says, Other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Does that say anything to you? I think the text is quite meaningful, standing by itself. Analyze it. Think it through carefully. If there are other sheep not of the fold that Jesus was speaking of, he wanted to bring them and have one fold, one shepherd. Is there a mystical body? Yes. Does God have purposes for that mystical body? Evidently, yes. Matthew, the 18th chapter, also suggests that there is something more than the mystical body because you couldn't have Matthew 18 if you didn't have an organic, obvious, tangible, real, live, honest-to-goodness church. Matthew 18, starting with verse 15. If thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault. Verse 16, if he will not hear thee, take with thee one or two more. Verse 17, if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as an heathen man and a publican. You're familiar with this sequence of how to deal with an erring brother. Now, if God was speaking only of the mystical universal church, whose names are only known in heaven, how on earth would you know where to go and who to take up the matter with? It would be impossible. So the very reading of this passage, it seems to me, suggests the truth that God has a church which is an entity in itself. And uh, it's a church that people know about. They know where to take their problem. They know when it meets and how it meets and all the rest of it. Mystical church, yes. Organized church as well. And, of course, Paul refers to the organized church when he talks to Timothy about officers in the church and how to choose leaders in the church, which obviously is something more than the mystical universal church. There's something that's just a matter of logic and common sense. When it comes to God's purpose, perhaps for uh, one of his purposes, for having an organized church, it would be pretty hard for me to run a school like PC, to own and operate one. In fact, it would be very difficult for a group of people who are all members of a local church to own and operate a school like PC. Could we? Right here. We have 2,200 regular members. Could we own and operate Pacific Union College? No. In fact, we've discovered that a local conference, which would be, for instance, the Northern California Conference, would find it impossible to own and operate a school like Pacific Union College. We have discovered that uh, a collection of conferences, Northern, Southern, Central, Southeastern, Nevada, Utah, Hawaii, Arizona, can operate two colleges like Pacific Union College. Why? Uh, because cooperative effort can do what a single person or a small group cannot do. Isn't that true? 
and this is true in industry, enterprise, whatever. So God is not against the organic church because it is through the organic church that God has often worked to accomplish, for instance, in a orderly fashion, the gospel to all the world type of thing. But of course, on the other end of that is the danger of beginning to worship our institutions that we have built and letting institutionalism become the thing that thwarts God's real purpose and his glory. There is a balance somewhere in between, isn't there? There'd have to be. And in the early church, you see an organized group of believers who go everywhere and turn the world upside down with uh, some strategy. Yes, strategy, organized, cooperative, unified strategy. But at the same time, their power uh, from the Holy Spirit. It can't be done by strategy alone, but neither does the Holy Spirit or the angels work individually. We understand that there is a high degree of organization in the heavenly country among the celestial beings. Isn't that true? Have you studied it? Have you noticed it? So whenever you're tempted to uh, get uptight about the church and throw the church out on the scrap heap, think twice and study what the Bible has to say on the subject. All three, physical, organic, and mystical. Now, I would like to place more emphasis as we draw toward a conclusion on the idea of the purpose of the members in the church. 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, is the famous one here that, uh, of course, likens the church and the members in the church to a body. And right here, I'd like to suggest to you that uh, the person who is a definite member of the mystical body of Christ, by that we mean that he belongs to more than the organic church, is the one who is a significant contributor to the whole body. You know, one of the worst things you could do would be to go only to a physical church week by week and know nothing more than that. That's one of the worst things you could do. And there are some people that realize that that's pretty gross and so they only go Christmas and Easter. And I don't know whether that's grosser or not, or whether that is even a word or not. One of the next to the worst things you could do would be to uh, simply be a member of the organic church and think your security for eternal life was based on that. It really is sort of foolish if you think about it. And yet there are a lot of people who are in that kind of thing, thinking. There are people who uh, find themselves out of the church for one reason or another. And they have grown up with the idea that your eternal life is based upon being a member of the church and having your name on the book. And so they do everything they can to get their name back on the church books thinking that their security is in that. It is not. God and the organized church are not necessarily the same for that kind of person and that kind of thinking. God is not the church and the church is not God. But the church is very significant to God when the two of them go together the best thing you can do is to be a member of the mystical, universal body of Christ, which means that your uh, 
Christianity is not contingent upon the organic or the church building, but that because you are a member of the mystical body of Christ, his organized purpose makes sense to you, and attending the physical structure with other believers also makes sense, right? Now, for what purpose? I like to suggest that the person who is a member of the organic church only usually always goes to church to get. And the person who is a member of the mystical, universal, real church, and therefore a member of the organic church, usually always goes to church to give. The person who comes along and says, I am not going to go to church anymore because I don't get anything there, is advertising his own problem. Have you ever heard this said? He's advertising his own problem because he is admitting that his primary purpose for going to church is to get. Was Jesus' primary purpose for going to church when he was here to get? What did he get? He got let out to the edge of town to be thrown off the cliff. That's what he got. See, if anyone des deserved to stay home and read the Inside magazine, it would have been Jesus. But he was always there. If you want to see the, the significance that Jesus placed on the church, even a very inept church in his day, you follow him as he closes his shop of carpentry on Sabbath and goes to the synagogue. And Jesus went to give. Sometimes he was given more opportunity than others to give. And sometimes you are given more opportunity than others to give when you go to church. But if you're looking for a chance, I believe that you can give. And if you don't think you gave, you may find out someday that you did give. When someone says, I was discouraged and on the brink of, this, you know, ready to give up, and I saw you there, and I heard your amen, and maybe some of us stingy souls who never say amen ought to learn how. And I kept coming. Is it possible that you can give when you don't know you gave? Or is it possible by just a handshake and a smile, even across the aisle, that you can give? All right, in 1 Corinthians 12, you're a member of the body. Maybe you are the hand, maybe you are the eye, maybe you are the foot, maybe you are the adrenaline. The adrenaline usually spends most of his time giving, giving more adrenaline, you know. And so Everson comes along with this kind of argument, which makes a lot of sense. No, each one of us realizes that when the tooth begins to suffer, every part of the body sympathizes with it. The foot runs along as fast as it can go to bring the tooth to some place where it may receive relief. The hand reaches out to see if there is something that can be put into the tooth to stop its aching. The eye looks around and does its very best to find a remedy that may be applied. Every part of the body is in motion trying to do something for the suffering member. It is not that when a person has a toothache gnawing away on his nerves, the hand says, well, I'm not going to bother with that. He made a mistake in eating too many sweets. Let him tend to himself. The foot doesn't say, well, I'm going off to sleep. I'm not going to worry about that tooth that is aching. No, they all become involved in the problem. The members of the body are so closely united that none of them can sleep or rest while one of them is in pain and suffering. And how in the universe would you ever know that another mystical member of the body of Christ whose name is known only in heaven was suffering unless you happen to be members of the same organic church or group, whether it met in Angwin or met in someone's home, at least the organic church, right? Again, you have this suggested strongly. 
When one member suffers, all the other members should do their very best to relieve the suffering in every way possible. No one should be allowed to suffer alone. The fact that his suffering may be the result of his own sins is not sufficient reason for leaving him to fight the battle by himself. A little suffering, a little scratch on the hand, if neglected by the rest of the members of the human body, may result in a very serious condition. If the little scratch is given prompt attention at the very start, the serious consequences may be avoided. But many a small injury neglected, something at the time doesn't, that does not seem of much consequence, may finally result in gangrene, locked jaw, or some other very serious trouble. So in the Christian church, if all the members of the church would take an interest in even the small matters that affect each member, that member might be saved for time and for eternity, allowed to struggle on alone in a difficulty, without advice and without help, he may eventually meet his end in destruction. You know, I suppose that's one of the things that makes some of us homesick for the little church. The little church. where everybody knows everybody else, <laughs> and sometimes it gets to be a problem, especially if they're all related, and uh, they all know the skeletons in the other one's closets. But there are advantages in the little church where you know what's going on. But in the big church, wherever you do know what's going on, this is the invitation to be a uh, significant, meaningful part of the body, of the body. May we conclude with Ephesians 4, 11 to 13. Ephesians 4, 11 to 13. After speaking in the first part of the chapter about one Lord, one faith, one baptism, he said that he gave to this church some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, pastors, teachers. For what purpose? For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. God has a purpose for the body, his own analogy for the church, and uh, Christ loved the church according to the same book, the fifth chapter, verse 25. The one that we use in marriages, in weddings. Husbands, love your wives. Even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. I believe that you will find in the church significance, even though you may also find in the church Hypocrites. Is that possible? I don't know if you've heard my parable of the Cadillacs, but I guess maybe you'll forgive me if I tell it here this evening. Having to do with the hypocrites. And the people who say, I don't want to be a part of this church because of the hypocrites. They were giving away 40 free Cadillacs in San Francisco. It was an advertising gimmick to the first 40 people in line on Monday morning. So guess who slept on the sidewalk in his sleeping bag Sunday night? Yours truly. 
when the windows were showing the beautiful Cadillacs in the service floor, and the doors were about to be opened the next morning. I was among the first ten in line for my Cadillac. I was certain of my new Cadillac, Seville. Or DeVille, whatever you want. As they were about to open the doors, I looked behind me, and among the other thirty people who were waiting for Cadillacs were some real hypocrites. And I said, well, if those are the kind of people they're going to give Cadillacs to, you can forget mine. And I turned and left the scene. Do you get the message? Has God's church often had people who uh, maybe shouldn't have been there? Yes. Did Jesus' own church have some that didn't belong there? About Judas? Or did he belong for a while? What about Ananias and Sapphira and others? Well, let's not ever get bogged down with the problem of the hypocrites in the church, please. On the other hand, I think most of us could witness to some real significant meanings from the church if we've been looking. I'll never forget having spent the summer in San Francisco and going to San Francisco State College to pick up a few credits and San Francisco City College to pick up a few others. In the uh, motley crowd of arriving back in uh, one of our Christian colleges and the first Friday night, sitting there in a group of members of the body of Christ and the overwhelming feeling of relief and peace and like having arrived in an oasis in the desert that came over me. People with more or less devotion, but uh, most of them there at least searching and seeking and to a certain degree interested some more or less, in the things of God. You know, it was a beautiful oasis in spite of the more or less, right? In contrast to skeptics and atheists and infidels and critics. So I uh, like the body of Christ. What about you? Uh, do you have anything you'd like to say about the church? What about the hypocrites outside the church? All right. Uh, have you ever heard of a hypocrite atheist? I, someone pointed this out to me one time. Uh, you don't hear about a hypocrite atheist because evidently being an atheist is not anything that great. But uh, being a Christian is really great, and that's why the devil has come along with hypocrite Christians, you see. Oh, hypocrite businessmen. Okay. Maybe even some church members in that category and outside that category. All right, anyone else? Uh, does anyone want to give a witness to the church and what it has meant to you or what it hasn't meant or a problem or a reaction before we close? Does the church seem to you a dry subject? No, I thought about that. Church is beautiful? Oh, you had two comments from one person. What about one from some others? Yes, over here.
here is a comparatively new convert, a comparatively recent convert, okay, who um, has witnessed to uh, the certain degree of coldness in the church, and she's trying to say it right, that uh, she sees in it a challenge to uh, not just love each other, but reach out to others as well with warmth and love. Is it possible to have a cold church? Is it possible to have a center aisle that you could ice skate down? Uh, I've heard it referred to that way. Yes. So let's not just all jump up and say, yes, the church is peaches and cream. But it can be, and to many it has been. And to you who speak, I know of some you have found who have had warmth, right? You can find what you're looking for, usually, yes? All right, here's someone who has seen the cold parts in the church, but also the warm, the hot parts, as you call them. All right. Way back here, yes. She says uh, she's often found fellow believers, church members, closer to her than own relatives, where you have a common faith among those members of the body, but not among relatives. Uh, how many of us have discovered that to be true? All right, we're going to... You have? Oh, I thought you were all raising your hands to speak, and we were going to be here till midnight. Oh, all right, way back there in the back, uh, loud, please. Aren't you one that used to be here and has returned? Can't see you that well. All right. Yes, over here. I was wondering, how long can there be coldness in our church? How long can that last? How long can a light burn with cold spots? Have you ever seen a fire with cold spots in it? How long can there be coldness in the church, he says? How long can that last? Well, you know, as long as there are people in it who are not really in it, right? How long will those people be in it? Until the end. Now, there comes a time when we're told the church appears as about to fall. And that would have to be the organic church. It wouldn't be the mystical church because the mystical church would never be about to fall. It's always true believers everywhere. So it'd have to be the organic church about to fall. But it does not fall. Instead, it remains while sinners are sifted out. There is a time coming when there will be nothing but warmth. And I want to still be with it when that time comes, don't you? Yes? I'd like to say, um, not, I'd like to remind people not to uh, forget our brothers and sisters that aren't in our, our church. You know, quotes. So we do have you know, many brothers and sisters that are beautiful Christians, not in our church. Don't forget, he says, the many brothers and sisters who are not in our church, who are beautiful Christians. <laughs> Please, that's the understatement of the evening. All Christians are not Seventh-day Adventists, and all Seventh-day Adventists are not Christians. Yes? Here, a young lady 
makes a uh, observation I think is quite obvious, particularly to the younger generation who have been perturbed by the older generation who think always in terms of the church and the younger generation always in terms of Christ. <clears throat> Sometimes you see it in writing. <clears throat> and you know, you can usually, I think you can usually identify, maybe this is just from the for what it's worth department, you can usually identify the person who is only a member of the organic church and not the mystical body by um, that tendency to talk about the church, come into the church, accept the church, he is loyal to the church. My children are in the church. You know, never the phrase, are they are in Christ. They have accepted Christ. When I accepted Christ, it's always the church. The church has become in place of Christ, you see. One here, then one there. I've noticed that in the uh, fellowship of the church versus the fellowship of the mystical church outside of the structure, in other words, the non adventist Christians, the beautiful Christians outside, I've noticed that I can have a good relationship with the Christians that don't believe exactly as I do. But the depth of relationship on a deeply scriptural, spiritual level, I have found to be much more difficult to enter into under the problem of, of great differing beliefs. So to me, the church, as a structure, is very important for the deep relationship regarding scripture. He says that you can have fellowship with fellow believers in Christ, but not as deep as fellowship with fellow believers in Christ who also are in unity on the Bible beliefs as well. This is what you're saying. Okay. That the difference in doctrinal beliefs can make a limitation to the fellowship. All right. And maybe that's uh, what I would lead into this question, why so many denominations? And does God have something else in mind? One more right here, and then we're going to close with, uh, I am so, I'm so glad I belong, how is it? To the family of God. <laughs> Hope someone will be able to start that for us. Yes. The warmth can be found where two or three are gathered together. This appears to be the smallest organic unit that God recognizes in this sense. You have been listening to another special American Christian Ministries presentation. This recording has been digitally reprocessed from the original audio cassette or reel to reel in order to make this CD available. The audio quality was improved as much as possible. International copyright, American Christian Ministries. All rights reserved. To order a copy of this or other presentations or for a free catalog, please call toll-free 800-233-4450. International calls dial 717-652-7000. You may also order from our secure website at www.americanchristianministries.org. There you will discover the largest selection of authentic Adventist preaching available. American Christian Ministries is not a one-man band. It is an orchestra of outstanding speakers who are all on the same theological page. If American Christian Ministries has been a blessing to you, why not take a moment just now and send us a note or an email with your testimony? We'll share it with our speakers and volunteer workers to encourage them. Your prayers and continued financial support are very important to ensure the continuation of this ministry as we help prepare America and the world to meet Jesus Christ. He's coming soon.